Um, political problem. First of all, nationwide and in California, those affiliated with political parties, the mass public, have sorted themselves increasingly uh, into the two parties so that we have liberals in the Democratic Party and conservatives in the Republican Party. So here what I have is a graph that shows you the average liberalism for people uh, and then over time for the Democrats and the Republicans, and what you see is these two lines diverging from one another. The Republicans are becoming less liberal, more conservative. The Democrats are becoming more liberal. And so the result is a real gap in the mass public. That's translated into, and then in fact fed by, a gap with respect to the uh, legislature. So here we have something called the degree of polarization index. It's trying to measure the degree of difference between the two parties in the legislature, and this goes all the way back to 1850. And what you see is that the degree of polarization started increasing in California in the 1970s, in the state assembly in this case, and then it just rocketed upwards. So that we have tremendous polarization in the state legislature, fed by mass polarization, and then in turn feeding more mass polarization in terms of the uh, candidates when they run for office. So, we have party ideological polarization, we have districting methods which often exacerbate that. Uh, we also have a situation, therefore, where Republicans in their districts are most worried about primary challenges because everybody's in pretty much a safe district, Republican or Democrat. Republicans are worried about primary challengers that say, you voted for taxation, I'd never vote for taxation, therefore, you should be displaced and I should become the new candidate in this district and therefore win the district since it's a safe district. Just the opposite occurs for Democrats. So Democrats who support spending cuts get clobbered in primaries by people who say, I would never support spending cuts. And therefore, you have two parties, one that doesn't want to increase taxes, the other one that doesn't want to cut services. The net result is you can't solve budgetary problems. But there's more. We're not finished. There's term limits. What term limits do is they reduce legislative expertise. It means you have people who don't have really much time to learn about the budget and become knowledgeable about it. It's not enough time in the assembly six years to really understand the way the budgetary process works. And furthermore, by about your third term in the fifth year, you're thinking about the next office. You're not thinking about making legislation. In addition, the problem is legislators don't get to know one another. And then finally, there's this problem. There's really no incentive for any legislator to decide they're going to be a centrist and try to be one of those people who work in the legislature, build a career as a compromiser, because you can't do that. You're going to be term limited out. So there's no incentives for anybody to do that. So, summary of the political crisis. Legislators differ in fundamental ways ideologically. They don't know much about substance. They don't know much about each other. There's no incentives for them to try to be compromisers. And then we add on top of that, Proposition 13 requires a two-thirds vote for any tax increase. And historically, because of the 1933 constitutional amendment, you have to have a two-thirds vote to pass a budget. So we have two-thirds rules for both the budgets and taxation. So you got people that don't like one another, don't know much, ideologically polarized, and then you say to them, but two-thirds of you have to agree. That's not a formula for getting work done. So any solutions? This is from data from a field poll, uh, late September, early October. I helped design some of the questions for the field folks. Uh, this just is a slide to tell you something about liberals and conservatives in California. Uh, liberals are about 23% of the population. Conservatives about 34%. Notice there's more conservatives than liberals here. And then 44% are just middle of the road. So a, a really big bunch of people. Uh, and what I want to do then is show you something about how attitudes towards various proposals or propositions about change vary by ideological perspective. So first, how about need for change? What fraction of the population says there's a need for change? About 52% of the population in California says there's a need for change. So there is a sense there's a problem. But notice how it differs between strong liberals who are over 60% believing that there's need for change and strong conservatives of whom only about 45% believe that. So ideological differences on that issue in itself. This doesn't say what kind of changes. This just says, is there a need for any change? But now let's get to concrete proposals. How about support for uh, replacing one of those two-thirds rules with a majority vote? 
for either taxes, which are in red here, or for the budget decisions. What you'll see here is there's more support for changing the two-thirds rule for budgets, but it's still not enough to get you above 50%. It's about 42% of the population as a whole that thinks it's really maybe a good idea to change the budget requirement from two-thirds to majority rule. A lot fewer, about 26%, believe it's a good idea to change the Prop 13 requirement for a two-thirds rule for passing taxes. And as you can see, there's tremendous ideological division here, with liberals generally in favor of some of these changes and conservatives dead set against it. So this, again, indicates that you have ideological differences, but in addition, that it's not clear there's really a majority for a change that might help solve some of these problems. So, change supported by a bare majority in the abstract, change of the two-thirds rule is not supported by a majority for either budget or taxes, and the net result is, the screen was black, um, <laughs> it's not clear how we're gonna solve our problems in California, we have created a governance structure in the state of California, which is really a delight to political scientists because we look at it and we say, gosh, that's all the things we tell people not to do. <laughs> and we tell them that if they do them, bad things will happen. Well, it turns out we're right. And we've done them all in California. And we've created essentially an ungovernable state. So that's why people like me, who for years said a constitutional convention is a crazy idea, nobody in their right mind would do that, is beginning to think that, well, maybe that's something in Somebody in there, not too crazy, might contemplate. Thanks. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm delighted to be here as a Berkeley grad. It's always nice to be able to come back to the campus, and I did feel that the training I got at the Goldman School was ideally suited to work in government, so I hope for those students out there who are potentially thinking of public service that uh, you will think about it seriously, because I really do believe that you can make a difference. I wanted to uh, emphasize that uh, politics is a contact sport, and after working for uh, the legislature for 32 years, uh, I'm used to honest dialogue and disagreement, and so I hope that particularly during the question and answer uh, that we will have that uh, dialogue today. I also wanted to emphasize that I'm speaking today as a private citizen, uh, not as a member of state government, and also that I'm not an attorney. And I think when you think about a number of the issues related to constitutional conventions, revisions, and amendments, uh, there are a number of legal questions that can arise, and those are certainly beyond uh, my expertise. I also wanted to mention that I haven't discussed this panel with my former colleagues at the Legislative Analyst's Office, in part because Repair California has submitted uh, two initiatives for title and summary, and my former colleagues are in the process of analyzing them as we speak, and so I didn't want to create any sort of conflict of interest. I think given the focus of today's seminar on the Constitution and Constitution Convention, it might just uh, be helpful to note a couple things about California's history in that regard. Uh, the first California Convention was actually prior to statehood, in 1848 and led to the Constitution of 1849. In interestingly enough, the delegates, all 48 of them, uh, met for six weeks. Uh, that Constitution lasted for 30 years until another convention was called in 1878, uh, resulting in the Constitution of 1879. And that's actually the Constitution, the platform of the Constitution that is operable today in California. The 1879 uh, Constitution resulted from 152 delegates uh, working for a period of six months. And it's my understanding that uh, there were tough times in California in 1878, and people were very concerned about representative government in California, and so there were a number of restrictions, particularly on legislation.